This video is brought to you by the good folks at KEH. Not only is KEH the oldest and biggest at what they do, buying and selling exclusively used camera gear of all sorts since 1979, but they do it well with integrity and both a 180-day warranty and 21-day return policy, free shipping on transactions over 49 bucks. Which is why, because they make it as futz-free a process as possible, they are our go-to whenever we are looking to fund new purchases by selling our own gear or buying that special used piece of kit properly graded and checked when we want to go quirky or old school. Check them out using the special links and 5% discount or bonus code in the video description below. Thank you, KEH. Over the better part of the last year, I've released three very special episodes of our Budget Gourmet series dedicated to the Leica M. But the most popular M today remains the M6, introduced in 1984 and manufactured through 2002. So today I'm going to talk only about the M6, well, pretty much, and maybe, hopefully, help you decide if it's the right camera for you. for three blind men and an elephant. And today I want to share with you things, let's assume you're looking for your very first Leica M, the M6 in particular, coming from the autofocusing digital world that you may not be thinking about, which, well, could either deter you from going that route altogether or convince you to jump in with both feet. I think you'll really want to watch all the way through and whichever way you go, it's all good. But as I said back in December 2021, the very first question to answer in your journey to that M6 is this. What do you want from it? Put differently, what does the Leica M6 experience mean for you? Let's take a couple of minutes to review what I said back then. It absolutely means different things to different people. Is it, for example, the talismanic quality, I call it, the history and heritage of the most iconic camera brand of all time, something you can practically feel every time you pick one up that most speaks to you? Is it the image quality from such small jewel-like lenses, the like a look, the act of focusing through an optical viewfinder integrated with a rangefinder patch, dynamic range limited only by one's eye? the simplicity of the shooting experience, the absence of today's mind-boggling array of function buttons, dials, and menu options, the tactile sensation of shooting with a purely mechanical camera with the earliest M variants not even needing a battery. Maybe it's the petite, unobtrusive size of the camera with a couple of lenses, no backpack or messenger bag necessary. Maybe a quiet, though not silent, shutter. So quiet, however, that back in the 20th century, several states here in the U.S. actually required cameras and courtrooms to operate at or below noise levels set by the Leica standard. Perhaps the experience of shooting with actual film and the surrounding silver halide processes, from loading to developing and printing in an honest-to-goodness darkroom yourself. Now, I also suggest that you watch all three episodes in their entirety. I'll put a link to them in the more section below this video. But for today, let's noodle through real world considerations if you intend to spend a lot of time actually shooting the M6, which is not the only valid reason to own one because the M6 is industrial art, a portal to history, as much or as little a time machine talisman, pure objet d'art, as you and your imagination choose to make it, hold that thought. Number one, unless you shoot slowly and deliberately, think landscape or portrait, manually focusing an M6 in real time, that is at the moment of capture, 
will slow you down dramatically if you're used to autofocus and do not yet have proficiency with rangefinder focusing, which you won't if you're coming from the world of autofocus and contemplating a rangefinder for the first time. What this really means is that zone focus, that is setting your focus and depth of field in advance of taking the shot by using the depth of field scale on your lens and working with a small aperture. Somewhere between f5.6, really f8 and f11 on a 50 millimeter lens is usually the way to go. This is in fact the way most of the greats in the M's heyday actually shot. Although f8 on a really good 24 millimeter is magic on the street. But at a practical level, this also means that a you will have to develop an idea of what those distances look like through the viewfinder in real life, and that takes a good amount of practice. B, by and large, clearly, you can forget about the shallow depth of field. And C, you can also forget about shooting handheld in low light due to the twin challenges of seeing in low light, although the optical finder helps with that, combined with the very slow shutter speed necessary to offset that f8 aperture and the much lower maximum sensitivity of today's fastest films compared to current state-of-the-art digital sensors. Although, learning how to brace your camera can make a huge difference. The irony is that working with an M6 just might make you better appreciate mirrorless cameras with in-body image stabilization. Two, the flip side of this is that the fastest shutter speed on the M6 is just one one thousandth of a second. And this means that in very bright light, you can also forget about shallow depth of field unless you're willing to futz with neutral density filters. Although. You won't have a problem shooting handheld in that same bright light. Using Tri-X rated at ISO 400, for example, under a noonday sun, you will run out of aperture flexibility, exposure flexibility, somewhere between f11 and f8. Any wider open, and you'll simply overexpose the film, which in turn leads to three. The M6 in particular, of all the M's, suffers from flare in the rangefinder patch and lower light transmission than the earlier M4 series and later M7. This is not usually an issue, but when I was out shooting with an M6 last week for the very first time, the ex not the first time I've shot with an M6 for the very first time this happened, on an exceptionally bright day, the focusing was impossible because the rangefinder patch was simply white. I'd show you the result of that, except for I can't, because none of our local photo specialty shops do black and white processing themselves and have to send it out. This is true in most places. The larger point, however, is that the entire feedback loop, from previewing depth of field and exposure prior to shooting to chimping immediately after the shot on the rear screen to see if you need to take it again, or being able to work on your images same day, same hour, same minute, never mind posting to social media, is gutted by using film. Which, for some of us, is a major part of the joy of film. You may end up taking very different kinds of photos than you do with your Sony, Nikon, Panasonic, Canon, or even Leica mirrorless cameras. And this can be wonderfully rewarding, liberating. But for many others, especially those of us weaned on smartphones or who, irrespective of age or technology, are early enough in their photographic journey that improving rapidly is a goal. Leaving digital for the romance of an M6 may prove to be a particularly frustrating experience. 
Five, this issue yeah. manifests itself in a number of other ways, beginning with the additional kinds of flexibility you lose by shooting the M6 or, fair enough, any film camera. A, no ability to simply change ISO when the scene demands it. You put in ISO 400 film, you finish the roll before switching to something more or less sensitive, like the black and white T-Max 3200 on the one hand or the color slide film Ektachrome rated at 100 on the other. B, which of course also means no switching between color and black and white on the fly either. Now, if you shoot color, you can always convert it to black and white once you digitize it, but most commercial scans I've tried thus far really don't capture the full information potential of a 35mm frame, never mind the color information which is actionable only when captured digitally at the outset. See, I should also mention that the exposure latitude of color slide film is much less forgiving than black and white negative film, which in turn leads us to this, D. The M6's built-in light meter isn't nearly as sophisticated as today's best matrix meter and highlight weighted meter and face priority meeting. You get the idea. Although, yes, a whole bunch of us may do without all of that before they ever arrive. They may do without light meters. The dirty little secret is that even Cartier-Bresson and Bourke White, however, often sent terribly under or overexposed film back to the labs. You will learn soon enough like with your very first roll of film through the camera, that unless you truly understand the limitations of a simple reflected light metering system, which only understands 18% gray in the central portion of the frame, until you truly learn how to navigate, that is, master that reality, which you can do, you may well be frustrated again, this time by how uneven your exposures turn out to be, even when you get both arrows to light up for every frame. Learn, baby, learn. Practice, baby, practice. That is part of the joy of an M6 or an M, if that's where you're headed. The other thing about the M6 is metering. No auto metering, no aperture or shutter priority metering, no program metering. The successor to the M6, the M7, does offer aperture priority metering. Speaking of exposure, like any other film camera, with the M6 you will also have to learn about, if you intend to take long exposures, using the bulb mode of the camera which in turn means using a cable shutter release and keeping it depressed as long as you want that exposure to be and requires you to understand something called reciprocity failure. Easy enough to calculate, but that means more study and practice. Just saying. The calculations themselves are no big deal. You can look them up. Now, I'm sure there's an app for that. Let's talk more about the integrated rangefinder, viewfinder, and more things you have to consider, which are part and parcel of the rangefinder experience. Things like frame lines, parallax correction enabled by the frame lines, minimum focusing distances, and auxiliary finders. Because while the M's integration of the rangefinder patch within a single viewfinder was state of the art back in the day, I'm going back to the original M in 1954, it was suboptimal even then for precision framing, not only compared to older view cameras, but compared to what became state of the art just a few years after that very first M, when Nikon introduced the dramatically more convenient, what you see is what you get, 35 millimeter single lens reflex Nikon F. Although, by the way, Nikon wasn't the first. That honor goes to the Kine Exacta of 1936. The point is this, you will be faced with the choice of navigating the challenges inherent to the M6 rangefinder through practice, 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 or paradoxically and not interestingly, simply letting go of and actually embracing all of the things you cannot control precisely in your composition, in your exposure, without that practice. Things like focusing on a subject or object that is less than a meter away because most rangefinder lenses can't focus closer than that, a function of parallax, that is the difference between what the camera sees, that is what is captured on the film, and what you see 
And as you get closer, it gets worse. The M6's parallax correcting, auto adjusting frame lines in the viewfinder notwithstanding, or having to guesstimate what will be in frame if you use a lens wider than the minimum 28 millimeter frame line of say the 0.72X M6 viewfinder if you choose not to incur the literal as well as more complex workflow costs of a wide angle shoe mounted auxiliary optical finder. Unless you go really old school and use lens goggles. A rather Rube Goldberg-esque approach to the whole auxiliary finder thing, although some of us will be smitten by this bit of mid-20th century paradox of simultaneously over-engineering and under-engineering a solution. F. Goggles or no, trying to manually focus a 50 millimeter lens at f2, never mind 91.5, is simply a very, very difficult thing to do for even the most eagle-eyed among us. Then again, again, most people don't realize that these challenges often result in what some of us consider the like a look anyway. And both Cartier Bresson and Margaret Bourke White, among many others, even when she wasn't using a Leica, she cemented her reputation using a field view camera, proved beyond a doubt that sharpness for sharpness's sake is a fool's errand, missing the art for the trees, if you will. There are other considerations and expenses in extracting everything out of an M6 that actually have nothing to do with the M6 per se, like the challenge of proper disposal of the chemicals used in developing the film, or since most people who shoot film don't develop it, which side note I think is a shame, you are missing both the control and satisfaction of it, the actual marginal cost per frame compared to digital. But let's slow down. I think we've spent sufficient time enumerating the reasons why the M6, in spite of its simplicity, perhaps because of its simplicity, may in the end be far more complicated and demand far more of you than you might have thought. So maybe all of this talk will lead you to change your mind about getting an M6 in the first place. But maybe not. Maybe you will conclude you want it even more than you ever thought possible because it is dawning on you during the course of this video that you will get out of an M6 what you put into it. That once you do master it, it will be much simpler and can be faster than even a state-of-the-art mirrorless camera. Well, for some situations, you will understand light better than you ever knew one could. You will be liberated from schlepping, courtesy of those small, incredible jewel-like lenses. Liberated from pages and pages of menus. Liberated from futzing with autofocus settings and losing the shot because you picked the wrong focus setting. And by the time you figure out the right one or get to manual override, the moment has passed. And you will get even more out of the M6. Here we go. If you reconceptualize what it is that you put into it to include your imagination, because if you do, if you consider how this mechanical, exceptionally tactile and kinetic thing first conceived and executed in primordial form more than a century ago can transport you across time and space, human history, humanity itself, if your imagination allows it, you may find an extraordinary photographic companion and inspiration, a Zen experience unmatched by any other camera. You hold an M6 in your hand. You behold it with your eye. You feel that extraordinary solidity and precision. You remove that roll of Triax from its yellow box, remove the film from its canister. Well, it used to be a metal canister, now it's a plastic container, probably one time use. Open up that bottom plate, lift the rear cover and thread the film into the take-up spool, close it up, and then
then magic as you wind those first few frames they get zero on the automatic frame counter the feel and sound as you trip that incredibly quiet shutter with that very short press. The satisfaction of feeling and hearing the gears, the compression of a spring or two, the click of an internal catch, all through one stroke of the advanced lever to reset the shutter and deliver the next frame. The magic at the end of that roll, when you flip the rewind switch down, open the canted rewind knob, Hear and feel the tension ebb as you continue winding fast approaching the point when the entire roll of film is safely back inside the light tight cassette itself. And knowing it's now only a matter of days until you see the result. I think I'll stop here because your journey begins anew. Now. Right now. It is all up to you. Although, you know what? I lied a little bit because you get to decide if an M3, an M2, an M4, an M7, an MA, an MP, any camera, a Nikon F2, F3, Canon F1, a Hassi 500 CM, really, depending on who you are and how your imagination rolls, any cameras can do the same thing. Almost. <laughs>Big shout out to KEH for sponsoring this video. A great resource for finding just this kind of gear. Check them out using the special links and 5% discount or bonus code in the video description below. Thank you, KEH. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, join the conversation in the comments section below because this is an exceptional audience. If you'd like help with a portfolio review, gear selection, finding or honing your artistic voice, sign up for a one-on-one -on -one mentoring video called Via Zoom at 3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, please consider supporting our work by using the no cost to you affiliate links down below, sending us coffee money via PayPal, or most especially joining us on Patreon links down below as well. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.